So what we did was we kind of morphed it into leverage because we're going to consist. We don't want to say, well, in, in your fight to track, you've got a leverage ball carry. We just went to straight call it leverage. And that was just us calling, cutting out the middleman. But it's 100% in line with what he's done. And a lot of the concept of it is too, um, with the coaching points of it too. Because one of the biggest difference makers that he has that he introduces is being able to infuse key performance indicators. So when we talk about key performance indicators, Right. This is pretty specific and it's in line with what he does with the five fights. Um, but again, just terminology changing a little bit is we're always looking coaching from the feet to the eyes. Right. Here's one thing that you think about. The further I am away, I want you to just think about this for a second. The further I am away from from somebody that I have to tackle, the two furthest parts of my body that have to speak to each other. Okay. Think about that for a second. The further away I am from somebody, the two farthest parts of my body have to speak to each other. So what are the two farthest parts of my body that have to speak to each other? My feet and my eyes. Those are on everybody, no matter who you are, the two furthest parts away from you. Your eyes and your feet are the furthest parts of your body from one another, right? It's the top and the bottom of your body. So you think about it as the window closes, the sin what has to speak to each other. The muscle groupings have to change. The sensations have to change. But the distance creates distance among yourself. So I have to, so I, I have to, my eyes and my feet have to talk to each another when you're 10 yards away from me. And I have to assess, my, my eyes have to tell my feet when to start to throttle down, what foot to work with, right? What shoulder to hit with. Like all that stuff has to speak to one another on the path and, and to do it. Now, reason I bring that up is because that's probably the most complex part of this thing to teach is the judgment. The judgment is probably the most complex part of tackling to teach. And within that, that's why if you notice some stuff we put in tackle study and when we grade it, we're, co we're constantly, constantly, constantly talking about laser focus. We're talking about where are their eyes. And like a lot of times we talk about fundamentals, they're off of a block or maybe they're on a block. So where are their eyes off of a block? right? You look at it right away. And again, while their eyes are doing that, what is, what, how are they closing space? How are they judging angles? How are they balancing themselves up? And how are they contending with the ball carrier now looking to avoid them? Because ultimately that's what the ball carrier is trying to do. So think about that. And now here's like kind of a way to drill. This is like a little bit more of a, there's some routine ways to drill it, right? This is more of a, like an advanced way to drill. It. Okay, when we, when we talk about it here, right? we talk about the idea that we're going to give some distraction in front of it and we're going to work around it. Okay, we're going to give some distraction and again, find an entry point. It's kind of like what we're looking for there too. But you look and see like, it's hard to maintain focus on the thing behind you. And again, he kind of like gets off path, but he, he finds that he has to recover. That's the fight concept of that right there. When we look at it, and just for time, I got a couple examples of different stuff as we look at it, but if you're talking about quick, he's looking, working around it, and then you look, see, okay, shortly out of phase, but he, what is the first thing that he does? He runs it back into another player. So he, can, he doesn't allow it to cut back because he tracks it, but he finds it and finds an entry point and, find, and, and is able to run it back to somebody. Okay, this is you, Tone, actually. You're in this one. Look at this. Look at you. Look at you. This, that's that's pre, uh, what do you call it, Tone? Anyway, uh, just, again, working in tandem with one another, too. And you look and see a lot of the stuff we put out with the tackle study is about like, what do you end up with? Like when you have to work off of another player and you have to work off of like distractions in there too. So you look and say you work off of it. And then this is, this in, in context is the quarters coverage stuff where you have an inside backer working with the safety. Like where is their entry point for each other? Where am I pushing the ball to one another too? And a lot of times you'll have a hold and a run through player in there as well. And we talk about burst, right? We want now, Instead of fight to prepare, we talk about the actual burst to the ball. We find that sometimes our unwillingness to take a shot is our overcoaching of balance, right? So we're coming to balance really is about leverage, right? When we talk about the transition from your posture of your body, whatever that line is, if it's 90 degrees or if it's 15 degrees, right? From there, how do you actually burst out of there into the ball carrier, right? In the perfect world, Okay, we, talk, we talked about the difference between the single double and the power plant. Key is, if we want to go ahead and, and, and this is great for kids, especially if they play Madden, 
you know, we want to get into their their our foot into their Madden circle, basically, whatever it is. So that's the ideal right there too. But sometimes that circle could be off. Hands now start to play a role in it, right? How big we can stay for as long as possible right before we dip and how square. Everything is about square and ability to stay square. You're going to find that more at times the low tackles are going to be about your inability to stay square, right? The lower tackles. Yes, you're going to be some thigh board tackles that you're running straight down and you're in line. That happens. That sometimes is reactionary. Different guys will do it in different ways. Sometimes it's taught. Um, open field dictates on that. Size differential dictates on that a lot of times too. Um, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying like the overcoaching of it sometimes. You know, it's not, it's not one way to do it, right, when it talks about it too. But there's different kind of – a lot of times that's going to be single leg when you're working it as opposed to double leg, which is going to be up around the chest, right? But regardless, it's about the ability not just to come to balance and accept, accept contact. It's about delivering contact. Just a small drill that kind of gets done with that. And this is just about a little bit about this is about levels and drop time. Just something we warm up players with. And you notice they're non pad they're just helmet in doing it. And then like get them run a line. And again, part of it too is with the, with the balls is about they have to maintain focus on it. So I'm standing behind it, trying to get them to run to a spot and then work and then get the single leg and stay square and be able to drop time. But Part of it, too, is just to be able to have their hands up and then be able to drop at the time. And these are just garbage pails at different levels somewhere to get, it gets square. Again, part of it, too, another concept is about restricting arms in there with it because a lot of times, a lot of times the reaching prevents the burst. But just some simple things like shoulder strikes in here allow them to go ahead and work pad under pad and get the full extension of their body and get as close as possible. And then, you know, rugby pads allow, obviously, for a lip. You can take a regular shield and just fold it over. Like, there's some things you can kind of do. But the key is, and you look at, like, that finish position is probably not the ideal finish position. We would probably want to put our elbow on the top of it, if I was correcting this, from the bag holder side of it, too. We're introducing just to put the on the top to force that there's kind of leverage that's working off of there as well. Um, Richie actually sells these bags, too. And then sometimes even with body position, like, which is donuts themselves, and you can see the film, right, Jackson? You guys are good with this? Yep, we got her. Yep, I can see it. Anyway. It's about timing and entry points and, and, and not being able to go ahead and be hesitant at the point of attack, you know, and you look and see, being able to burst and find an entry and explode out of the entry, right, is one of the keys to it. And I just play that again. And this is just the timing of it that works back and forth. Like, those are stacked in there. So he's got two things working in equal opposite directions. So he's got to almost work, I don't know if you can see the cursor, in and around and work back over but try to stay on that line as much as possible, right? You see them sometimes when they do wrong, they try to skip around it, they let it go. And that one piece of hesitation puts them out of phase pretty quickly. And this is something that helps. And then now we, as he's bursting out, his contact, and if you see where his body actually position is, he's now leaned into it because his body is reacting to that, right? He's, his momentum is saying, I'm going to go ahead and accelerate through that at that point. That's full-scale burst. That's great body position. He's running right now at full speed, right? There's zero doubt about that, right? How many times have you had a player that you're like, got to pick it up, you got to get faster? Well, if you don't burst through that thing, you're going to get clipped by it. If you get clipped by it, you're not going to be able to burst through it. Like, we, I have young kids, so it's like if you give them pick a pancake, like you want some syrup, it's going to just keep on going. It's going to keep on rocking and rolling. So kind of look through there with it. We had a question there, Coach, for sure. the the – the, the previous drill where the guys had their arms around like the pole there, what material do you use for that? Is that like a broomstick or? Uh, you can use a broomstick. Um, I've gone with PVC. Probably PVC is the most durable. Yeah. I'm a little susceptible to broomsticks because they pull, because they their reaction. I want something as durable as possible. I'm probably going at least one inch thick if I can. That was probably a little lighter than usual. But they will react by pressing their buys into them. And I just want to avoid for the safety concern. I don't want to pull a broomstick into them unless you got something that's taped or heavy. Use broomsticks in the past. Try to go with PVC. It's a little bit more durable. Um, and especially when they forget them out in the rain, they're still going to last for you too. Kind of thing. I had another question actually there. You know, the, the drop time stuff um, kind of interests me. And can you just maybe go back and touch on that? Like what, the, what the, exactly do you mean by drop time and what's the importance of – kind of syncing that up with making the tackle and, like you say, bursting to the ball. 
So, so, and actually this is, this is going to be an example of it here, which is going to be good, but I'll talk about it first. So the drop time piece is going to be first off about be, being as big and as square as you can for as long as you can. The thing is we don't want to give, we want to, own, again, it goes back to this. You're owning a spot on the field. The running back is running towards a spot on the field and you're run, running to that spot on the field. If you can get that running back to run off that spot and declare in a different direction than you are, then you are, you are now in the, in the better leverage position, right? So if, you're, if they're going to be stubborn and they're going to go to that spot, I want to make sure that when I get there, I'm anticipating a drop time from them, a drop in the pad. They're anticipating contact. But I want to go ahead and first and foremost maintain that structure as I'm heading towards that spot so that as I'm doing that, I can get them to basically play the old school game of chicken and get off the spot before I do. And if they can declare and turn their shoulders – um, you kind of saw that in the one with the Colts guy uh, who, who, who banged him back. He starts to change his direction with the football. He starts to work in a different direction. I now have – I now own the spot, right? He's now determined that I am on the spot. I am showing maximum color, maximum squareness on that thing, and I'm going to hold that until the last possible moment, right? And that last possible moment, I'm able to drop down. You know, dip, uh, my dip time is to drop down, and I can t teach to strike on the rise, which is what we're basically doing on there too, if that makes any sense for you. Yep, absolutely. So here's an example. This is a great example. It's one of my favorites. It's from a couple of years back. This is the BC game tone. So this is back-to-back. -back. This is actually back-to-back -back plays. And what I love about this is that the player falls back on his teaching. The first one, he's going to fall off. I'm going to, I'm going to forewarn you. There's a disclaimer. He's going to miss this tackle. So I like this. There's a little bit of an older film. It's one of my favorite clips to show. Again, Casper, Casper plays a lot of role in this stuff, too. It's bringing back bad memories for Prince. But the, uh, um, watch the first one, right, as he works through, and the player falls off. You'll see it from the end zone, what ends up happening. And you look and see because he's not staying big, and, and the, the runner is still square. So what you're looking at is you're looking at number 10, back end, left side. He's going to work back where the, where the umpire is on the field. Works where he doesn't take him on, and he kind of doesn't say square and falls right off of him, okay? This is the next play that happens, the absolute next play, okay? What ends up happening, okay? And you look at him from deficit. He's still in the game. It's still square. But now you look and see the difference about him staying square and being able to go ahead and stay big and press through that. There is zero coaching that happens on the sideline there because it's the next play. Right, there's no way to go ahead and make all his corrections. He's got to fall back on, and the PV sill drill was the drill that he would do for this to get to the point where he'd look at the difference. Boom. He stayed square, and what did the back do? Right? On the first one, just to go back, because it's just really good, the back was square. The back didn't declare. The back ran right through him. I just love to play too much. Sorry. Watch the back is square and run and lowers his shoulder. On the second one, watch the back declare. Sees him? Declares. He turns his shoulders. The back turns his shoulders because he stayed big. And that's just the basic. And again, that's definitely a different level of kid, right? From one to the other. But that's one of the things that it says. And here's just an example of some ways to get guys to stay square, you know, and working with it. You know, and, again, this is, this is PVC. This is not anything creative with that stuff, too. And this just works inside with it. Um, you know, I have filmed from, like, different places with it because there's good examples of it, too. But you notice we're not getting full-blown contact from there. We're really just working footwork and, in, and in, in anticipation as opposed to the next phase of the drill where we work the contact off of there, what that looks like from, from – so – Somebody had asked, so what we basically did was we went from posture to alignment. So we, we cut off the burst, and we're teaching, like, right in between the burst there, too, as opposed to. These are two separate days. Like I said, where does this fit into the scale? This would be a, basically a teaching repetition drill. There's no choice in here. It's just straight repetition, right? So there's two different drills. They don't have all this fancy bells and whistles and vision decision action. It's just straight repetition, like in there, and we're just building, building, building off of off the last one. So you get into like a little bit with space and kind of look at the science of it. One of the easiest things to do 
is, like we said, the hardest thing to do is distance for the, the top and the bottom to talk to each other. So an easy thing to do is just change some of the perception. So one of the things we do is, you know, and let me just go back to that for a second. The reason I have it is because if I could predetermine, and just like there's a lot of people go, well, how do I change this? How do I change? If I could predetermine how far something is, then I'm already counting how many steps I'm going to take, right? So that's on the left-hand side. Whereas if I just change the planes of the bags, I don't know. If I point to a bag, I don't know how far away I am, right? Speed is going to be a determining factor, and speed is going to get them to run to that cone. So I kind of look here just in a drill, right? And you look at – and I'm going to get into the whole idea of driving. That's the same plane, right? That's basically the same plane. He could predetermine – that I'm going to run to that can, and if I have to veer off, that's I'm, I'm right on top of it. Right? I'm trying to get through to that back end one and work through it. Now, as opposed to, if I fast forward here, right? Right here. Okay. Now, if I change the plane, I'm still running as fast as possible. Now, i got to veer off that last second. I'm not going to get as thick of a hit, so i got to be reactionary to it, too. Right? I've got to feel what that is. Right? Depth perception, I can perceive where it is. I can run. I know how many steps. Depth sensation, I've got to feel where that is. You know, football is a lot about that, especially with the way the game moves and how far it is. So there's a lot. There's a, you know, it doesn't always have to be that fancy right? to create some kind of like choice in a drill, to create some kind of sensation in a drill. Sometimes it could just be as easy – as changing the, the levels and the planes that are off of it too. Because this is reality. This happens in game situations more than we think. And then we talk about 